Awesome. So, um, so Ed's been here the entire time, and he now he knows about getting into medical school again. <laughs> so, um, I guess whoever wants to go first. Yeah, I, I go ahead and go first. I will say uh, mentoring is really important to me. So actually, I, I got a lot of info from that because a lot of students that I uh, that I, I mentor are actually they, they want to get into medical school, too. So it's a good refresher for like extra information. Um, but yeah, so so my name is Eduardo Martin. I go by Ed. I'm a second year medical student at Michigan State. I'm originally from the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles, and um I come from an underserved community. And so I went into medicine because I want to work in underserved communities. Um, I went to community college part-time for five years and that's because I was working part-time, excuse me, full-time. And um, also because I had a hard time finding the classes that I needed to actually transfer. So in the community college district in LA, there's just, there's not too many classes. So I ended up going to five different campuses in order to kind of get all those classes. Um, once I transferred to UC Riverside, though, I got my double major degree in neuroscience and bio, and then I did a post back at UC Davis after that. I took a year off to study for the MCAT, and now I'm at MSU. I'm a second year student studying for step one. Uh, I take that in about two months, and from there, I'm going to move to Flint because I'm part of the leadership in medicine for the underserved program here at MSU. Um, I guess I'll go next. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Grisia Campos. I am a third year medical student also at MSU. I am originally from El Salvador, moved um, to Los Angeles, California when I was 13. Um, I also went to community college. I went to Santa Monica Community College for about two years, mostly um, due to financial reasons. I identify um, as queer, I went for most of my undergrad education as an undocumented student. So I didn't have um, access to financial aid and really community college gave me the option to pursue higher education at a lower cost. So that helped a lot. Um, after Santa Monica Community College, I transferred to UCLA and I was there for about three years. I got my degree in psychobiology and truthfully my time at UCLA wasn't the best. I wasn't uh, performing well academically. I was struggling coming out, was struggling finding um, financial support. I was working a lot. Um, so I really didn't have much time to focus only on my academics. And so when I graduated, I knew that I wanted to go to medical school, but I wasn't sure how I was going to do it. Um, I remember going to um, our academic offices and them saying like, I don't think this is gonna happen for you. This is gonna be really hard. Why don't you pick another career? That would be easier. But anyway, I don't listen to them. So I um, I pursued a post back, kind of a do-it-yourself post back program at UCLA Extension. Um, so I was working full time and just taking evening classes at UCLA Extension, mostly upper division science courses because I wanted my science GPA to increase. Um, I took a very long break between my undergrad education and starting medical school. I took about six years. And during that time, I felt like I really grew as a person. I really did all the things I didn't get a chance to do while I was at UCLA and all the added stress. So I was um, volunteering at a clinic um, called Clinica Romero. I was doing research. I was able to get paid for doing some clinical work, which I think it's important. Um, you know, we deserve to get paid for our um, for our skills and for our work. Um, I was able to engage in advocacy for Central American refugees, and um, overall, I don't regret the time that I took off. I think it's really impacted the way I want to practice medicine in the future. And yeah, so now I'm third year. I'm also part of the certificate that Ed is part of uh, leadership in medicine from the underserved. So now I'm in Flint, finishing up my um, clinical rotations and taking step two in a few months. Very nice to be here. Yeah, 
Yeah, so Krista reached out to me. Um, I think it was at the same time that we invited Dr. Maurer to speak, and so it kind of worked really well, and she was able to uh, coerce Ed to show up as well. So um, we're going to leave it to you guys to ask any questions you want to ask them because um, they're here, and you guys could um, type any questions you have in the Q&A, and they will answer anything you ask them. So. Um, I have one question. Can you guys talk a little bit, since both of you did postbacks and both of you did postback differently, uh, talk about your various experiences and why did, for example, Ed decided to do uh, the the UC postback versus Chris, Chris, Chrissia doing her own? Uh, yeah, definitely. So I... I uh, I was actually okay doing either. I, I ended up doing the UC Davis postback because uh, it was just an opportunity. I happened to apply for it and then I happened to get accepted to it. So I was like, you know what, it's, it's a formal program and um, it comes with, I believe, uh, I believe like it was for sure that you were going to get a letter of recommendation, which I did. And so I felt that that would be um, strong going into medical school, getting a like a letter of recommendation from a postback program. And so I took that route. Um, I think I honestly, though, would have been just as good doing one outside of like a formal postbac, uh, like uh, Christia did. And um, but yeah, that's really the reason why I did it that way. Yeah, I think for me, um, it was a lot of uh, financial. So like I said, I I, I um, didn't have access to financial aid. So that was one thing that worried me. Um, and also like having to take a lot of time off to do it full time um, was a worry I really needed to work. And so I, that's why I decided to do um, UCLA extension because most of the classes at UCLA extension are in the evening. So it allowed me to work um, during the day. And then um, something that I kind of did was that I applied to a bunch of positions at UCLA um, and, you know, like one, I got one and that really helped because I didn't have to commute that long to go to my classes. I could just literally get off of work, walk to, to my class. So that really helped and I would really recommend it. I will say that, um, you know, it's, uh, there are advantages of doing it, um, like Ed did, because I feel like there's more support than doing it, uh, yourself. People, um, in UCLA extension classes were trying to do different things, not, not all of not all the people that were trying to do pre-med. So definitely something I missed, um, more like networking, more support that you don't really get at UCLA Extension. Yeah, that's that's a totally great point. Uh, very true. There was a pretty much everyone in the post back program was gearing up to get into medical school. So you did really have that uh, cohort of like people that you could study with, friends that you could study with. Um, networking totally true there was definitely networking opportunities so yeah thanks for bringing that up it's been so i feel like it's been so long ago studying for step <laughs> speaking of studying we have a question how did you guys prepare for the mcat and what was your schedule like as a medical student in terms of balancing life studying for exams and getting clinical hours i i go first um, so I decided to leave my MCAT um, until I was done basically with all my classes. So I, um, I took it towards the end. I took it the year that I applied to medical school. Initially, my plan was to take it early in the year. So that if needed, I could retake it. Um, but unfortunately, that didn't work out. I didn't feel ready. So I had to push it. Um, and I ended up taking it in April. Um, so in terms of schedule, I, I was lucky that I did have a supportive, like I was in a supportive work environment. So I, I was work, I was working full time, but I knew that that was not going to be sustainable. So I did talk to my supervisor and I, I shared with her that I was going to take this very important exam that was very important for my career. So, um, she was able to give me some days, uh, or like, uh, cut down my hours, which really helped. So my schedule was basically um, going to the to, to the UCLA library at 7 a.m. and then go to work at 11. So I had some hours in the morning to study, and then I would study um, some hours when I got off work. 
Um, I would take practice exams every once every Friday, um, every other Friday. Um, and basically just, you know, just being disciplined with yourself and being honest. But I would say one big thing was having a supportive work environment because you do need to dedicate time um, to this exam, you know, and um, I know it's hard. I know it's not for everyone and you might have a job that it's not as supportive, but you have to weigh your options and weigh like, what is it that you really want for your future? And, you know, if it's a job that's not supportive, maybe finding another job that will so that you have the time to actually focus on the exam and definitely don't take it think if you don't feel ready for it don't think don't take it thinking that things are going to change during the exam and somehow do well if your progress hasn't shown that yeah no super super great points uh so let's see how did i study for the mcat i studied for it throughout my post back uh, so a lot of the a lot of the classes that I did in my post back were related to material that was going to be on the MCAT. So that was a, a good advantage for that. And then um, I'm also lucky. So my my now wife, uh, I was living with her and she was working full time and I was working part time. So it kind of allowed me that sort of financial boundary in order to kind of spend more time to study. Um, so I studied pretty much the year after the MCAT working part time. Uh, and pretty much did it that way. I studied with TPR, if uh, the Princeton Review, if anyone <laughs> was uh, kind of wondering about that specifically. And uh, as far as, let's see, it says, what is your schedule like as a medical student in terms of balancing life? Yeah, there's definitely a learning curve to learning how to just balance your life uh, at pretty much the medical school level. So uh, I think you, at least for me, I came to realize like, oh, wow, I actually had more time than I realized prior to medical school. And I think that's just because as your available time gets like less and less, you just learn to be more effective naturally. And then you look back and you're like, you know what, I could have been way more effective in the past as well if I had kind of like done things this way. Um, at least that's just me. Uh, so I, yeah, and so you end up doing that and you start, I, I know this is true of a lot of people, you have to just kind of tailor pretty much your whole life, you have to organize it out, schedule it out. Um, instead of like, I know when I was living back at home, like I could talk to my parents anytime, but now it's like, oh, hey, look, I got maybe 30 minutes on Sunday. Like, is it cool if I call you then? So a lot of just scheduling out and um, yeah. The other thing is that also talk about that, how you're not working and you're just a student. So that's, Very true. Yeah. So th that is one benefit. Once you get to medical school, there's not like the 20 hours a week, at least for me, it was, you know, I was working 20 hours a week. So there's not that extra sort of time taken away from your week. Um, and yeah, so you get that extra time. That extra time, though, does get filled up with other pri other things you need to be doing in medical school. So whether it be research, um, whether it be clinical hours, uh, extra studying that you have to do. I mean, you're still in courses on top of that. So, uh, yep. Yeah, I would say that there isn't like a one fit all approach to studying in medical school. You know, some people might uh, be able to study like five hours without a break. Some people might need to study two hours intensively, get a break and then come back. So I think um, it's a lot of figuring out what works for you. Um, and it might not be what worked uh, prior to medical school. Cause I feel like the, um, the, the depth of the material or the way that we need to know the material, it's different than prior to medical school. Not, it's not, not scary, it's cool to, to learn stuff um, that way. But so I guess like the way that you approach your studying has to be different. And I think like what Ed said, uh, um, there are other things that you have to be doing in medical school aside from your academic responsibilities. You know, like if you want to volunteer, if you want to do research, if you are interested in um, being part of a club, so like all those things that do take up your schedule. 
Can you guys talk a little bit about your Flint program and what's unique about it and what's, um, and you said you're doing the extra certificate, so. Yeah, I, I think, so Chrissy would definitely know more about this one. She's a year ahead of me, so go, go for it. <laughs> Yeah, so the um, Certificate in Leadership for the Underserved is a program that you apply um, when you're applying to medical school, actually. That's how I applied. Uh, so it's a supplemental application on top of your secondary application to MSU and um, basically ask you questions. Why do you want to work with underserved um, communities? What kind of experience you have? Um, but basically, your uh, third and fourth year, you have to move from whatever campus you're in, so either Lansing, Michigan, or Grand Rapids, Michigan, to Flint. And most of you have probably heard about Flint. Unfortunately, it's one of the most um, underserved areas and cities in the United States. You probably have heard about the Flint water crisis. So, you know, there's a lot of resistance in the community, a lot of community um, collective work um, from Flint community members to um, improve their city. Uh, but basically the certificate allows us to train um, in Flint. And then during our third year, we have um, kind of like extra elective. So we're placed at different Flint community organizations while other classmates might be doing clinical work. We're able to do community work. So I was at the Latinx Community Center here in Flint. Um, so that was cool because, you know, it gave me a look into the community and not just at the hospital level. And then during your fourth year, you get to do an elective. In the past, people have gone abroad, uh, but our new director has made it so that we can either stay in Flint to do an elective, um, and it has to be um, focused on underserved and an un serving in an underserved population. And then we also are required to do a research project that focuses on um, an underserved community. And so I feel like it's a lot of you, you can make of it what you want. Um, but if that's one of your passions, I would consider it. And oh, and then I was gonna say during your first and second years, second year, you have a little bit of extra didactics where um, Dr. Smart is the director of the program should bring like speakers to talk about different topics that pertain to underserved um, health. Um, so this is a, uh, how, this is something that somebody asked, uh, what is it like moving to Michigan? How did you adjust? Uh, what was helpful when you first moved there? Yeah, I'll, I could probably take this one. Uh, yeah. So moving from California to Michigan was a really, really big culture shock. Uh, so, um, there's just a lot of things in California that you don't necessarily have here. And like, I'm used to eating Mexican food, like almost every day, cause I'm Mexican. And so, and so it's, it's hard to find out here, just smaller things like that, that you end up realizing once you get here, you're like, Oh, you know what? I didn't even notice that that was just so normal for me back at home. Um, but things that I did to kind of acclimate here in Michigan, uh, on a funny note, you know, make sure you get a good jacket and some, uh, some good warm shoes. Um, but outside of that, it's really important to just stay connected to your social group. Um, make sure to make friends out here with your classmates. Um, if, of course, if you have family and if you're in contact with them normally, make sure to just stay in contact with them, you know, keep them in the loop of things and keep that going. And uh, for me personally, I really enjoy meditation. So that's been something that's just been really important to me, uh, just to kind of like, keep me acclimate, get acclimated and grounded in really any sort of environment. Um, and I think that really helped in general to just get acclimated and situated here in Michigan. Yeah, I would say it's sort of the same, uh, like what Ed said, it's a big culture culture shock to come to Michigan. I'm Salvadorian and I'm used to having Salvadorian food everywhere in LA. And so I do miss that a lot. Um, I feel like a common theme among, among Californians here is the food. So enjoy the food where you can. Um, but aside from that, um, 
I think that first I was very scared, like, what is it going to be like? Am I going to be happy? It's so different. But really, it's um, changing like your mindset. You know, I started thinking like I got to move across the country to train to be a medical doctor. Like, who does that? You know, like, how kind of how cool is that? Like, I get to live in a different state. Um, also, like really cool things in Michigan, like actually experiencing four seasons. I. Uh, been enjoying the snow, been enjoying fall colors, summer's coming. And so, um, yeah, just really be open to different experiences. And there are a lot of things you won't experience in California. And I think all of that does add, if your goal eventually is to move um, to wherever you're from to train, that does add to the kind of doctor that you will be. Um, just having those extra resources and having those extra experiences. And kind of uh, growing and moving out of your comfort zone, because there's a lot of that, just moving out of your comfort zone to go to a different state. And of course, there is the uh, missing your family and definitely important that you still stay connected. Luckily, now we have Zoom, we have FaceTime, we have so many ways to stay connected um, that it's not too bad. Um, this is another question. Can you discuss applying to MSU and the reason why you apply to MSU and why you chose to attend MSU? Yeah, definitely. I um, So for me personally, I was really interested and in, still, of course, I'm interested in uh, community health and um, just working in underserved communities. And so I one of my mentors was telling me uh, She's like a pre-med mentor. And she was telling me that she felt MSU really aligned with their mission statement, really aligned with the things I was interested in medicine. And so she uh, encouraged me to apply to MSU. And so I did. And for that same reason, I also applied to the LMU program. And um, I think that was it for the question, unless there was a second part to the question that I missed. Yeah, just that why, you know, why did you and why did you choose MSU? Yeah. Yeah. And then I ultimately chose MSU uh, because I, I really did want to do the LMU program. I really liked the idea of getting out of my comfort zone, like Christy was saying. And um, and I think it it pretty much provided those things for me. And this kind of oh, sorry, uh, Chris. Uh... Yeah, I was going to say that I knew, um, I was kind of involved with Mi Mentor in California, and I knew a couple of uh, people who were here. So that's kind of what initially put MSU like in my list, and I talked to them, and they had had a good experience. And then ultimately, same, I felt like my application really aligned with MSU's mission statement. And then when I came to the interview, I was pretty impressed with um, like the kind of questions we were asked, the kind of students I met. Um, I met Dr. Maurer um, during my interview day, and I just overall got a really good vibe from from the school. And yeah, and that was that's part of that. One of the other questions, kind of on that line, is: Do you think moving would be an issue towards medical school, and meaning that if you don't want to move states? Um, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I, I think it really just depends on the particular applicant. So, um, I think the, like, if, if you fall line of fall along the lines of like a more traditional student and, um, you feel like you're going to have to sort of cast the wider net in order to get an acceptance to medical school, I think that sort of coming to terms with the idea that you might have to move out of state might might be sort of beneficial for you so it's not so kind of jarring if that if it does come to that um and i think mostly it would come down to that yeah i think like what would help is kind of um coming up with the reasons why you um don't want to move you know and whether those reasons are like out of fear, like I was saying, because you're gonna miss your family or there are like stronger reasons that you don't want to move. Um, and then also, I guess, um, 
one one thing that people will say when I was in my pre-med journey was like, you only need one to become a doctor. You only need one acceptance. And like, that's very true. So, so I get it. I get them moving. It's, it's hard, but um, yeah, making a list of like your priorities, I guess, would, would help. In deciding if you want to apply to only in your home in wherever you are now versus moving outside of, of your state. Yeah, and I, I guess I just want to add something. Well, one of the things that I realized was that a lot of my mentors actually also ended up moving out of state. And um, it kind of took away that sort of, I don't know if the right word is fear, but that like inclination to not really want to go out of state. I mean, I realized like they're really great doctors. I really want to be a doctor. And for me personally, it came down to, if it came down to it, would I be okay with moving out of state? And for me, it was a yes, definitely. Yeah. And I think the big challenge is, and the reality um, of being someone from California is that there is more applicants for spots, I think something I read there is 37 applications for one California seat in medical school. So it's, um, so all the medical schools, MDs and DOs put together, there's 37 people applying for that application from the state of California. This is not even in excluding people that want to apply from out of state. So in the reality of it is that you know, there there is a possibility that if you want to be a doctor, you have to leave California. Um, but also the positive side is that you could always come back because uh, medical licensing is, uh, is a national thing. And once you're licensed in one state, you just have to go through the process of another state. So, um, and there's a lot of people um, that, went to MSU. I have a friend who went to Michigan State and she's doing her emergency medicine residency at UCSF. There is another person um, that I know from MSU who just matched into family medicine at Stanford. So you can come back. So it's not like you're banished forever, but it's the reality of it. Yeah, definitely. I would say MSU has um, has been having really good match uh, lists, and most people who want to go back to California who are from California have uh, matched back back home. So it's not that you're gonna be gone forever, for sure. One of our next questions are: What are some aspects of being a medical student that you wish you had known beforehand? And these could be either positive or negative. I guess I would say um, I really thought I would it was going to be more stressful than it is. So it is manageable, I guess I would say. Because um, so that's a positive. Because <laughs> I felt like before I thought, um, oh my gosh, like people are studying twenty four seven. They don't have time for anything else, and there is time. Um, the other thing is that I guess once you get to med, I, I didn't really think of residency when I was a pre-med. And I do think a lot about residency now, just in general, like about medical tra training and about how, um, how long it is, how, what are things I need to change in medical training, um, things that are good, things that are bad. I didn't think much about that. Um, cause I was very hyper-focused on like getting into medical school, but once you get into medical school, you have to think about your options. So the other thing also that I didn't think much about, it's about the different, um, specialties that there are. I think I was pretty much, um, I pretty much only knew about family medicine, but there are many other ones. So I would really encourage you, um, as pre-med students to shadow different specialties too, so that you have more when you get to medical school and it's less, um, I guess, less stressful having to figure out what you wanna do and knowing that there, there are options. Yeah, I, I think just to kind of piggyback off of what Christia said, um, 
I think that it's true. Like when you're trying to get into medical school, you're so hyper focused on trying to get into medical school that you you almost like, at least for me, there was like this sort of lag phase where it's like, oh wow, I'm here. And it's like, oh no, no, no. Now it just starts. Like now you actually have to get to work, you know? So you put in all that work to actually now put in more work. And it's probably a weird way to look at it, but I found that to be really true. And I think like if I was to have to do it over again, I would go in with that mindset of like, okay, yeah, that's the finish line, but it's also the starting point. And then one of our other questions is if you guys could talk a little bit about what it's like to balance work life with um, being a medical student and also, you know, uh, having a relationship. Yeah, so um, I was lucky that my partner was able to move with me to Michigan. So that's been um, really nice. That's, um, it's also been nice to move to a different state with someone that you know, that you can, that can support you. Um, I would say that um, the advice that I got before I started medical school was making sure that I made time for dates, you know, for actually sitting down to have dinner. And that's important because medical school can be very consuming, especially when you start um, third year and you have to be in the hospital and you're studying for step like Ed is studying right now. And it feels that everything has to be about that. Um, so it's doable, but the person that you're with has to be supportive and has to know the demands of, of medical school. Um, so I guess it takes a lot of being honest and a lot of saying, hey, like, you know, I, I do have to study Saturday night and I can't um, go out to this party like I used to, if that's the thing. Um, so just a lot of honesty, a lot of communication and really like, like Ed was saying, this is a long, you're in for the long run, you know, so you want to make sure that you're with someone who's in it with you for that long too. Um, and then the other question was, uh, balancing your work-life balance, being a medical student and. Yeah. So you're, ten, um, during medical school, you're not expected to work. Um, most medical students don't work. So I guess that's not much of an issue. I know that there are some classmates who do like tutoring here and there, or they might get an internship, but um, I would recommend against working, but I understand that's not possible for some people. Um, and so I think that goes back to uh, very being very organized with your schedule and also being in a supportive medical school, I will say, that understands that. Yeah, I, I could I could definitely uh, agree with everything Christia said. I, so I'm, I'm actually married and my wife, she lives in California. I'm here out in Michigan. And so um, definitely for me, and I'm sure this is true of, of any couple with someone who's in medical school. So my wife and I are both in medical school. And the cool thing about that is that we were both able to understand each other when we would say like, hey, listen, I, I really, really need to focus right now. Um, so I probably won't be able to spend as much time like this week or for the next like two weeks, three weeks, wh whatever it might be. And, um, and, and if you're with the right person, they'll completely understand that. And thankfully I'm with the right person. And so she completely understands that. And when she has to tell me the same thing, I'm, I, I'm completely understanding because I know exactly what that feels like. And so, um, yeah, just remembering that and uh, make sure communication is key. So I think that uh, as long as you let your partner, or significant other know kind of what's going on, I have this coming up or I have that coming up that kind of smooths things along the way. Can you guys tell us how you found um, understanding partners? Just kidding. Joke. Okay. Um, our next question is, what do you think was the hardest part of the application process? And then what was the toughest part of your interviews? I would say the toughest part of the application, uh, I have two. <laughs> so secondaries, because it's just so much writing um, and I don't, ex I, I mean, people tell you, but you really 
uh, don't understand that until you're in it. And then also waiting, like waiting for decisions is tough. Um, Cause you know, at that point you tried your best, you know, you gave it your best shot and you just have to wait for decisions. Yeah, so uh, so I got a follow up question about talking about couples matching in residency. So I kind of so thankfully I, I don't have to do the very very stressful couples match um, <laughs> because my my wife is a year ahead of me, and so what I'm going to do the thing I'm going to do is wherever she gets in I'm just going to apply to that same hospital system and pretty much everywhere around there. Um, but I do know of people who have done the couples match and I understand it's a very, very stressful process. It could either work in your benefit if you're both quote unquote, like competitive, or it could start working against you if you're quote unquote, not competitive subjective terms, but, um, but yeah. And then Ed, do you have any insights to what was the most difficult part of the application process for you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I'd say for me, specifically the application process, and I'm going to throw in like interviews as well. Um, it was just to, to just remember to calm down and remember why I was there. You know, it's just like, hey, listen, remember your why, you know, and, and if you do that, everything typically falls in line, I, I come to find. Um, I think it's easy to get kind of caught up in the process to get a little stressed out. And uh, sometimes it gets hard to take a step back and just kind of look at why you're there and why you're doing everything it is that you're doing. And um, I'd say that for me, it was interviews and because naturally on my mind was like, okay, I've been putting so much work in everything depends on this one moment right here. And it's like, that's the completely wrong way to look at it, you know? Like if you go in with that mindset, you're going to make it harder for yourself. Um, and, and one of the things that I learned is as you go on in the interview process, just naturally with extra repetitions, like things get easier. You kind of learn, okay, that worked. This didn't work. Um, so for me, it was more like the interviewing uh, component, especially with the MMIs. Those could be a little interesting from time to time. And then one of our other questions is, at what point did you know that you wanted to be an MD? Was there any particular moment that stood out or was it a culmination of many different experiences? Um, for me, it was definitely the culmination of many experiences, um, which is why when I was writing my personal statement, I had the idea that I had to have this big revelation, you know, that, that made me want to be an MD. Um, but really, like, like I said, like during the, um, I was able to volunteer and do a lot of advocacy work. And I think that really showed me a lot of health disparities, um, just working with patients, um, talking with patients in Spanish is a big like um, factor for me. Um, kind of like learning about my parents, like struggles, finding, healthcare, finding doctors. So for me, definitely it was a combination of, of a lot of things that made me want to be a doctor. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty similar in, in that way. And, and I'm also not surprised because we're both in LMU. And so a lot of us have a lot of similar stories like that. Um, so for me, though, specifically, it, it was it was, yeah, like I come from a medically underserved community. We had a really hard time seeing a doctor when I was a kid, uh, just due to financial circumstances. And then even when we did, there was a lot of disconnect because my parents spoke Spanish and like the doctor only spoke English. So I would have to translate or one of my siblings would have to translate. And that was really difficult and rough at the time to sort of translate that, especially as a kid. Um, so that, that was really meaningful to me in sort of carving out my path to medicine, as well as... Um, for me specifically, so my, my dad actually ended up having this really bad accident where he fractured some of his vertebrae in his back and we didn't have a doctor that we could just go to or like, uh, like a neurosurgeon to do spinal surgery or anything like that. And so to this day, he lives with chronic pain and that's something that always sort of stuck with me and just seeing the importance of 
providing healthcare for people who don't typically have the access to healthcare um, is something that's really guided me through medicine and ultimately led, led me to want to do an MD. And that's a, such a personal and like a unique experience for each person. So what reason worked for Ed um, may not be the same for Chrissia or for you. I mean, um, so, but thank you for sharing that. That's a very personal experience. Okay, one of our next questions is, how would you describe the dynamics between medical students at MSU? And how would you describe MSU's medical school's approach? Um, um, so I would say like, we're pretty, um, so we don't have grades. So I don't feel like there's a lot of competition. Like. I feel people are pretty, um, like to collaborate a lot. Um, something I was gonna mention too, that there are a lot of people from California. Um, so that's really cool too. Uh, but I would say like, um, yeah, I don't know if, I don't know in, if in terms of like something specific, but I would say everyone is pretty chill. Um, I've had really good experiences with my classmates so far. So during your first year, well, when you come in, you get put into a learning society. It's it's sort of like Harry Potter. You put into you get put into a house, <laughs> and then from that you get put into a smaller group of eight students that you kind of meet with um, every week, and that's sort of like your learning group. Um, and luckily, I had a really good group. Um, I'm basically best friends with. The majority of them and that was really nice because it took a lot of the stress during classes and just sharing resources um so i would say like we're pretty cool honestly and uh how would you describe the msu school approach so um what is it that they call it they call it the flip curriculum flip curriculum so basically we don't have real lectures but um, you learn the material before you go to the lecture and the lecture time is basically devoted to discussing the material. So it is a lot of learning on your own. Yeah, flip, flip uh, classroom, exactly. So it's not, you're not gonna have someone that stands in the front and goes over 200 slides and teaches you. It's more of like, yes, there are slides, but it's stuff that you're supposed to um, uh, participate. So it is a lot of um, doing stuff on your own, which might not work for some people. And that's something to know about MSU. Um, you have to be disciplined enough and also find the correct resources that work for you. MSU does offer resources, but that doesn't mean that those are going to work for you. So I know some classmates use other resources to same the same material, to learn the same material. Um, so yeah, so that's why it's a lot of um, being disciplined, a lot of learn, learning um, what works for you. And then once you go to class, it's like learning to apply it with, with our uh, preceptors. Yeah, definitely. I, and I would say, I guess the only thing I would add to that is that another way to think about it too is is like you're given all the material on the on the front end so they're like okay listen you have class next week here's the readings and all the materials and you need for that class so you're expected to kind of read through it get through it on your own and then once you show up to class it's just time to apply that knowledge now so then you get like certain um like made up patients in a sense and they say okay this person comes in with these symptoms this is their history these are the medications they're either taking or not taking, like, what do you think is going on? And then it's up to you to then kind of go back to the readings that you did. So, you know, the prior two days or maybe three days or however early you wanted to get on top of that and then just apply it. And then kind of connected to that, could you discuss your experience with the preclinical curriculum and is it more lecture-based or care-based team building? 
Um, and do you feel like it's prepared you for rotations and stuff? So definitely more team-based. We don't really have a preclinical uh, curriculum. We basically start with clinical since first year. So the first um, nine weeks of medical school are basically devoted to learning uh, how to do vaccines, how to take blood pressures, like how to interview a patient. And then from ninth week on, you're placed into um, mostly a family medicine clinic um, since your first year. And then second year, you do have min, like mini rotations. So like second year, you rotate through women's health, you do um, adult wards, pediatrics. They're not as intense as what you would have during third year, but they're meant to give you an intro to that specialty. So um, like I said, we don't really have formal lectures, like what you would expect um, where the professor stands in the front and you just listen, it's very um, interactive. And then in terms of how to prepare you for STEP, so that's the thing, right, about a curriculum like this. You make out of it what, it's basically you make something out of it. So you can either be super ready when STEP comes because you had the time and the resources in the front end, or you can be not ready because you need a more structure. And that's kind of where you have to be honest sort of with yourself. So for me, I did have a really hard time with STEP, um, mostly because I had a hard time learning how to study at the beginning. Um, it was hard for me to uh, not have a complete structure of, you're gonna go to class, you're gonna learn, from 200 uh, slides, the slides are gonna have everything you need because that's what I was used to. And so just realizing that from yourself early on, uh, but there's a lot of time in the MSU curriculum to start studying for STEP early on, as opposed to other curriculums where you have to take um, exams every week. We, we only have exams every two times a week, uh, two times a semester, two times a semester. So there's a lot of time, right, to do whether what you want. So it really depends, I would say. So it's something to know. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And so, yeah, we have like two exams that are um, more like your typical sort of bubble in the answer is A, B, C, D, E, or F. Um, and then we have two that are more like clinical based. So you get like uh, patient actors, I forget like the technical term for it, but it's like people who act out like certain symptoms and standardized patients. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Standardized patients. Um, and it's up to you to go in there and try to figure out, uh, what's going on with the patient. And then after that, like they give you some questions about it too. And not many, it's like two or three after that. Um, but mostly it's just like the interacting with the patient component. Um, and that was supposed to simulate step two CK, but I don't have to take, at least we don't have to take, I don't know if Chrissy, do you guys have to take it? No. Okay. That's awesome. Good. Yeah. Uh, and so, but they still decided to keep it in there because they feel it's, it's important just to your learning. So you still have to do it. Um, one thing I want to add though, uh, about just like, uh, I'm going to touch base on a question that was asked previously about how this curriculum compares to more like a traditional curriculum in a traditional curriculum, you really if you kind of think about it, like you just have to show up and like the information is sort of just given to you and you're just like, okay, let me just absorb this information with this one. And so with this curriculum, if, if you're not like with our curriculum, the curriculum at MSU, you really have to be personally driven or else it's going to be really, really difficult because it's, it's no longer just being given to you and like taught to you in, in a lecture hall. Like it's up to you. No, you have to go and like read the material on your own. You have to go watch the videos on your own. Um, there's no one there. It's like, it's just different when you have that type of component and it might be like, well, you're learning either way, but believe me, it's different. <laughs> and so um, I would say just like, know that going in, if you end up going to MSU, just kind of know that going in that you're really gonna have to be personally motivated to get through the material. And then could you guys speak a little bit about study skills that you found useful when you were still an undergrad? Um, 
Yeah, I, I could probably touch base. I don't know that. I mean, uh, I would say that a lot of the study skills that I did have were were good. So, I mean, I was like a cram for exams extraordinaire. Like, uh, that's just how I always did my exams. And so, and it worked for me. You know, it, if it didn't work, I wouldn't have done it, but it worked really well for me. And so, uh, quickly in medical school, you come to find out that's not going to work. And so, um, so if anyone, and I, I know it's not like super unique to me. I, I know a lot of people who were the same way. It's like, yeah, that's just, if you're able to do it, you do it. But here you end up just sort of learning more of like a slower pace every day, a little something every day, a little something. And, um, that just tends to work out better, especially just with the amount of information. Cause like step one is if you think about it, it's like a cumulative exam of two years worth of information. Typically in undergrad, you're getting an exam for one month worth of information. So it's like times, you know, it's like in addition of like 24 extra components of that. Um, and that could be pretty tough if, you're not spacing it out properly. So I would say if you're spacing out your learning right now, keep doing that. Um, also, if you have any sort of techniques that allow you to memorize a lot of information effectively, definitely lean on that. Uh, there's certain resources like Sketchy. I'm sure you'll learn about it if you haven't heard about it already. Um, and they use a lot of like spatial visual recognition to allow you to kind of recall information with like cartoons and all that. Um, so if that's already how you learn, like, I know when I was doing flashcards, I would do that in order to sort of get a lot of information quickly, like, oh, this kind of sounds like this funny word. So, you know, that's going to allow me to just recall it really easily. So things like that, like whatever allows you to just learn easily, just stick with that and then build on top of it. Yeah, I would say for sure, cramming is not the way for medical school. So if you can learn not to do that um, as an undergrad, it will serve you a long way. Um, I think also like learning how to review things that you've learned before, and that's still something I'm figuring out now. But for example, if you took a biology course and then the next semester you took a sociology course, how can you still keep in some of that bio course um, somewhere in your memory. Um, so a lot of medical students use Anki. I don't know if you probably some of you have heard about that flashcards as a review method because um, it's hard to keep all of that. You know, like it's so easy to focus on what you're learning that week and not remember what you learned two months ago. Um, so I would say that uh, spacing, uh, studying, and figuring out a way that works for you to review information you've learned a month ago, two months ago, because in an exam like step, you need um, that repetition. Yeah, definitely. I, I guess the only thing I would also, I, I, one of the things I guess I want to add is like, what some of uh, my fellow like classmates that I noticed learn really well is um, they're always connecting the information that they learn. So like, let's say you learn something new about like the liver. Right. And it's like, OK, you could just learn if you think about it, like you could take that information in and you could say, OK, I know these things about the liver. And to be honest, that's actually going to make it really hard. It might be really easy for you to remember in that moment, but it's going to make it really hard for you to remember that in like two weeks, two months from now, two years from now. So like you really have to start uh, whatever you learn, like apply it to something, apply it to the things you already know. So, OK, I know like these drugs are bad for your liver. And I'm learning about liver disease. Okay, so, oh, that would make sense. These drugs, I remember like hearing about it in this one course, that's really bad. That's kind of how they, I could see how they kind of connect here. Oh, I'm also learning about like socioeconomic issues and like how that ends up coming up with like liver disease, for example. I'm not necessarily saying that it does, but I'm sure there's like some correlation there. But just like connecting that information to what you're already learning or what you have learned is like key, really, really key in like long-term memory. And then one of our other questions is, do you guys ever get burned out and how do you cope? Oh yeah, I, to be honest, my step one journey was not pretty. So I definitely got burned out. 
I had to delay it a couple of times. I started my third my third year um, late, and I'm I share all these things because, you know, medical students struggle, and even if um, it's not, it, it shouldn't be um, a taboo talking about it as long as you're you know keep moving on from it. Uh, but things that help me is. Um, I, I'm lucky that I have really good friends in medical school and I feel like that just venting sessions, crying sessions, writing sessions, whatever helps rock your boat, um, taking time off from whatever you're doing, going for a walk, like, um, that helps me a lot. Um, I started therapy also as well during that time during um, when I was studying first step and that comes with also finding the right therapist that understands um, what you're going through uh, for me it was also talking with family I'm really close to my parents my sister I'm really close to my partner um, so it really takes a village I would say when you're burnt out and just recognizing that you are um, in that in like recognizing what you're feeling in that moment and being able to say, okay, I'm going to take a break, but then also coming back from that, you know, it's, I would say it's pretty important. There might be a lot of setbacks in medical school, but that doesn't say anything about the type of doctor you will be in the future. And um, yeah, as long as you, I would say find the, your support system for sure. Yeah, that, those are some awesome points. Um, uh, let's see, I, I guess for me personally, um, things that if I've ever been burned out, I don't know that I would say necessarily burnt out, but under a ton of, ton of stress and like <laughs> wondering, hey, where, where's the light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I, I feel like everyone kind of goes through that, whether small or large in medical school at some point. Um, and for me personally, kind of connecting to what Chrissy has said is like, you're really going to have to lean on your friends um, really, really big time. So I, I study with my friends every day and uh, you also need to learn how to take breaks. So that's something I didn't even realize was as important as it is. Like not so much taking a break. Everyone understands like you need to take breaks, but like you need to take an effective break is really the key there. And so what, what does that even mean? Like for me, what it means is you know what, playing 15 minutes of a video game with my buddy for a break. And that definitely gets my mind off of studying. It gets my mind off of anything. Like I'm just completely zoomed in on that break. And then my brain, when I want to go back to, to studying, it's like, why well, I actually gave it a break. It wasn't like, oh, I was sitting on the couch, but I was thinking about chemistry. You know, that's, that's not really a break. Like you're still using your brain. Like it's, it's not a real break in that way. Um, and I think that was something that I had to learn. And I didn't really know how important that was, but that's really, really important. Finding that thing that allows you to just kind of disconnect from what you were doing and disconnect completely. Yeah, I have, um, I got one question about um, mental health resources and wellness. So I guess in talking about MSU, it was actually pretty easy for me to find a therapist and it was also free, which I was very um, surprised. Um, I had never um, seen a therapist before um, last year, and it was a pretty positive experience, actually. So I would say um, it's at, at least at MSU that that was an easy process. Yeah, definitely. And, and uh, I would also say that there's, there's actual good, good resources like Christia was alluding to um, here at MSU. So uh, someone, especially like if you're in the East Lansing campus, oh yeah, there's two campuses to MSU. So <laughs> there's a Grand Rapids campus. You you could either go there for your first two years, you could go to the East Lansing campus. I'm in the East Lansing campus over here. Uh, we have like, we, we have two resources for anything mental health related. So it's like Dr. Uh, Brady and Dr. I forget the other doctor. Um, but they're there and like from the first orientation week, they, they tell you like, okay, if you have anything related to like mental health issues, any questions, anything like that, talk to them, like they'll kind of guide you to where you need to go. Um, and I, I found that they're helpful. They know 
exactly where to guide you. I, I've had friends tell me they're also helpful. So um, I, yeah, I, I take that and uh, I think they're good. Kind of building on that question, um, somebody is wondering if there's free tutoring services and other academic support services for students at MSU. Yeah, we have um, the Office of Academic Achievement and you can get a free tutor. It's usually an, an upper class, um, a, a student that's higher up. And then you can also get an academic coach. So that's like actual employees, um, usually MD. So it really helps that they've gone through medical school or um, people who've done a ton of research and what works um, in terms of like, um, studying strategy. So we definitely have, and those all resources are free. Um, you can meet with them as much or as little as you like. I think I met only once during my first year, but got a tutor for anatomy, but I really use them a lot more during second year. Uh, things that they helped me with, for example, was coming up with um, a schedule for my step one exam that was really helpful. And you can get a tutor in anything. It can, it can be in general, someone who just sits with you to do questions that you might not necessarily have specific uh, questions about the material, but you just wanna do um, UWorld world questions, or you can get a tutor specifically for epidemiology or specifically for anatomy, but, um, and it's at no cost. Yeah, and the cool thing too is that, um, let's say that you get a tutor and, and you just feel like you're not connecting well, like maybe their teaching style doesn't connect with your learning style. There's a lot of different tutors. So you could just put in a request and they just have them. They'll, they'll have like seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 tutors that you could just click on another one and like schedule a meeting with a different one. And and uh, yeah, they're definitely all there for your benefit. And there's some really great resources. And then we have a question. Did either of you ever consider other healthcare professions such as PA or uh, RN? And if so, what made you decide to go MD? Um, so I didn't. I, I like, like I said, I was hyper-focused on medical school. So I did not consider any other um, healthcare professions. I think I... One of the big reasons that I wanted to do the MD route was because of um, like the scope of practice, I would say. Um, and then also like I'm interested in other things. So for example, research and most of the, I guess the people that I saw doing research or being primary investigators were MD. So that kind of swayed me that way as well. And also I, um, I felt like I didn't want to have, I kind of wanted to have autonomy in like the healthcare system. And I felt an MD gave me that autonomy too. Yeah, I was, um, I was in between for, for a short while I was in between. Um, so I always knew I wanted to do surgery and that's my goal, uh, to this day. And so, um, for a while I was in between like maxillofacial surgery and I was under the understanding. And apparently this is true that you could actually do that route through dental school and then do like two years of medical school. So if, if you want to do that, you have to do like dental school and medical school. And, uh, for that specifically, apparently it's a shorter route through dental school. So I was for a part little while I was thinking about dental school, uh, but I decided, you know what, like, I just want to keep my options open. It might turn out that I'm interested in some other type of surgery um, and medicine will allow that. So I ended up just sticking with MD route. And then we have a question. Can you discuss the cost of living, living in uh, Michigan relative to California and for both of you, now that you're um, transitioning to Flint, is there any support to move or transition to that area? And did you need a car while living there? Um, yeah, so it's way cheaper than California. Well, at least um, LA, Bay Area. <laughs> 
uh, Southern California, it's way cheaper. So the cost of living, everything, food is cheaper, taxes cheaper, rent, gas. Basically, you're going to spend less if you go to medical school um, in Michigan. Um, and then in terms of moving, so moving is always tough, you know. So I was also in the East Lansing campus, which is a, an hour and a half an hour from Flint. Um, so moving is hard. You don't realize how much stuff you have until you have to pack everything. <laughs> um, I say like, I would say like in terms of um, financial, there are there isn't really any support aside from your financial aid um, to move, but it's Flint is also a little bit cheaper than Lansing. So it wasn't that difficult to me, except for actually packing and like the logistics of moving. Um, but I will say it wasn't a huge challenge to move from Lansing to Flint, personally. Yeah, I, I, I'm I sure I'm going to feel that too, because every time I have to move, I'm like, oh man, this is terrible. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, as far as to just kind of mimic what Chrissy has said, the expenses here are really a lot cheaper. So like for a two bedroom apartment, you could expect to pay anywhere between like, I mean, 900 to a thousand. I mean, if you really, if you really, really want, like you could find some really, really nice stuff and then you could get closer to, actually you won't even touch the California prices. It's not even comparable. Um, maybe you could move it up to like 1300 tops if you really wanted, but that's not too much. And for a two bedroom, right? Like I remember, paying for like 1500 for a studio in California, you know, like that's crazy. So uh, yeah, it's definitely cheaper. Uh, you could save money on that end, but if you're not a state student, you, like you are gonna have to pay more. So you'll, you'll probably break even anyways. And I was gonna say that, and I forgot to um, answer the thing about the car. I would say you do need a car, especially because of the winter. Um, you don't want to be waiting for public transportation and like negative degree weather. So yeah, you need a car. Yeah, I, and I don't know so much about the Flint campus just because I haven't moved there yet, but I know some classmates, they like, if, especially if you live with roommates and you live really close to campus, like you could ride your bike. Uh, I know there's a couple people who do that. I don't know how feasible that is in years three and four. And I, my understanding is it's even harder to like live close to the different hospitals that you might have to be at. So then it would really not make, make much more sense. But if you had to, and you really wanted to, you could probably get away with not having a car the first two years, but yeah, years three and four, it sounds like Christy agrees. Like there's just no way. <laughs> We have a related question. Somebody uh, was wondering regarding the out-of-state tuition, are you able to get Michigan residency if you come and live in Michigan for one year and then um, before applying? Uh, yeah, you can. So you could, um, you could, yeah, you could do that route. Um, I had heard that you could also, I mean, I heard this, I don't know how true it is or not, um, but I heard you could also like work part-time your first year and that might make it that's like a loophole that you could possibly then apply to get Michigan residency I don't know anyone who actually did that I heard that you could possibly do that but I don't I never actually heard of anyone doing it um I knew that I just wanted to focus on medicine once I was here so I was like you know what I'll just take the hit and um yeah just kind of take care of that later I just want to piggyback on that really quickly. And I'm somebody who's kind of struggling with the should I move somewhere to get in state residency? But if you're a California student, remember that you are, you know, California does have the most medical schools of any other state. And to give up California residency for another school, you got to make sure you're really 100% committed to that other school. I just wanted to add that in quickly. Um, and we do have another question. Wondering what do the two of you want to do in your practice as a doctor? 
The one million question. I have not decided yet, uh, but I have to decide by September. <laughs> so I have limited time. But so far, I'm considering um, ob or very different or internal medicine. So uh, we'll probably be one of those two. Yeah, I, I kind of touched base on this one. I'm so I'm really interested in uh, spine surgery and just orthopedic surgery. Um, and really, the more and more I get into it, just really any surgery. So I wouldn't be surprised if I just end up doing general surgery and then like choosing a like subspecializing after that. And then just a question about the Flint program, are rotations at one hospital or are they throughout different hospitals in the region? So we have two main hospitals that we rotate in. And then for um, our family medicine rotation, you actually go to a private practice around the area. And then for psychiatry, we also go to different practices around the area. So two main hospitals and then like small private practices. Okay, right now the Q&A box is empty. If anyone has any other questions they'd like to ask, go ahead, now's your chance. Um, I have a question. What, have, what about the research opportunities that are available? Yeah, I, I could probably take this one. Uh, so with research opportunities, they um, you have an option to, well, I guess, first of all, like you, you are going to be expected to do a research project. Um, and it's a small one. It's like during first year, it's not like a really intensive collaboration. It could just be whatever you sort of think up. And you typically have to do it with your rotating like the places you're rotating at during first year. Um, so you might be in pediatrics and you're like, oh, I'm curious to see what the vaccination rates are in pediatrics during COVID. And so uh, that would be just like a quick one. And then you could work with like the hospital staff there and just kind of expand it out as you like. And then beyond that, um, I know for our LMU program, we have to do a research project. I know Chris, you mentioned that. Um, but then even beyond that, if you wanted to, uh, there's Mark Trottier, I believe is his name. He's, um, he's the pretty much the person you go to if, if you want to get involved in research here at MSU. And uh, you tell him, there's like a survey that you fill out. You tell him, uh, I want to, I'm looking into this type of research because I want to go into this type of profession. And uh, he'll pretty much reach out to you whenever he finds a mentor who could take you on or has an opening and is like, oh, hey, you might want to apply to this opening here. And that's pretty much, that's been my experience. Yeah, and then um, the one thing I did like about the East Lansing campus is that we have the university right next to it. So Michigan State University is like pretty big. It's like a big university in Michigan. And so I was very interested in doing research with um, LGBTQ community. And I didn't really find anyone doing that within the college. So I just like message professors in other departments. So I'm working with professors in the sociology department. So yeah, so you don't have to, you know, stay confined to, to the college. You can really like expand depending on your interests. And we do have someone asking for clarification on one of the previous questions. Um, do out-of-state students have to pay out-of-state tuition for four years or after their first year of medical school, can they apply for residency and reduce tuition? You know, so, uh, yeah, my understanding is, and like, I, I haven't met anyone who does it otherwise, but you come here and let's say you just come here for medical school uh, and you're just a medical student, like you're gonna be paying out-of-state tuition for four years and there's really no exception to it. Uh, it's a bummer, but it just kind of is what it is. And um, 
And that's why I kind of mentioned, I heard, I don't know how true this is because I haven't actually met anyone who did this, but that you could like work part time and then try to apply. But even then it's like no guarantee. Um, and I wouldn't bank on it personally. Uh, if, if you were like thinking about choosing between two schools, you know, especially because it's a maybe. Um, and so, yeah, it's pretty much full out of state tuition for four years. Yeah, and these rules are, are set by uh, state legislators because they support these universities. And so they don't want somebody to come for one year and, and they get that. Um, I think there's rules, certain rules in certain states that if you're registered to vote, you ha own a house, or you pay property taxes or those types of things, then you could qualify for it. But it's like a, every state is different and uh, and they may not, you guys might not even know the, those details. Um, the other question I was going to ask is, have you guys traveled back to California or have you guys have been exiled to Michigan the entire time? We're trapped. Once you come here, you can leave. <laughs> we forgot to mention that. I'm just kidding. No, yeah, I definitely go. There's a there's actually a scholarship. Um, I don't know if you've applied to it, Ed, but I will message you. Um, it's called Lanzate, and they give... Um, basically plane tickets to students who are more than 200 miles away from home. And I've gotten it basically every year. So that's been really cool and really helpful. Uh, but yeah, I've been to California a couple, many times. Um, not much dirtier because it's a lot more um, busy. But yeah, I go, I went for holidays, summer, Yeah, I would say, uh, so I did not apply to that thing. Please, please message that to me. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, like I've, I've, so, and with me specifically, because uh, my wife lives out of state. So I'll either travel there or she'll travel to me, whoever's schedule is more flexible at the time. Um, but it's definitely doable. I, I know everyone who like comes from out of state who goes here. I don't know anyone who typically stays for the holidays or any big holiday for that matter or even for summer. Um, what does your wife want to do? She wants to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, well, can you talk about, um, and Chrissy is the only person, um, the difference between third and fourth be and between first and second? Sorry, um, you said the difference between um, third and fourth year and first and second? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, yes. Yeah. So do, uh, I guess the biggest difference is that you spend a lot more time in the hospital, basically 90% of your time in the hospital doing third year. Um, you basically have to do rotations and what they call core clerkships. So rotations in internal medicine, rotation in ob pediatrics, psychiatry, um, surgery, and I think I'm missing something, family medicine. And basically you're there uh, sometimes the whole day, sometimes the whole night for ob or surgery. And the biggest difference is that unlike first and second year where we only had exams twice a semester, we now have an exam at the end of every rotation. So it's a little more stressful. And with that comes that you have limited time because you're in the hospital a lot of the time. So you have to find, be very disciplined in doing uh, and reviewing every day so that it doesn't pile up at the end. I would say that's, um, it's a lot more structure, a lot more busy, and sometimes a lot more stressful than first and second years, but also a lot more fun because you're seeing um, a lot more things like you're in the OR, you're talking to patients, you're literally practicing a lot of the things you learned during first and second year. And 
then we have one other question. Do you feel like there's a strong sense of collaboration among students? And also, is there support for underrepresented students to feel a sense of community and belonging? Um, I don't know if you want to go first, Deb. Um, yeah, I do think there's a lot, there's a strong sense of collaboration. Um, honestly, I feel like everyone shares resources, shares study guides, shares tips on how to do um, well on exams. I um, haven't felt, um, you know, I haven't felt the people are trying to compete or out showing you or I don't know things that happen probably in pre-med. Um, and then in terms of support for underrepresented students, I will say that the college, um, it's doing a lot better in um, supporting, for example, LMSA or SNMA, um, MSPA. So um, in the past, from what I've heard, those organizations were not as, as strong, but I feel like they have a really big presence now and it has been because the college has made an effort to uh, bring more underrepresented students um, in each of the classes. So um, I would say that you do find your community. It won't be like California where it's obviously a lot more diverse, uh, but there's, and, and, and there's room for improvement, but I would say it's, it's um, there's definitely a supporting community. Yeah, and and I would say that you you pretty quickly find find your group out here, and um, like you know, so me and Christina were both from California, so I, I'm sure that I I know I did this, and I could I'm willing to bet that Christy did like, oh wait, who else is from California here? <laughs> and so uh, so like naturally, you know, you, you look for for people who are also like from where you're at, and um, you just naturally connect because you're both in a new state, and it's just like. You're, you're all trying to just figure it out. And so it becomes like your, your family away from, from your family in a sense. Um, and so you guys support one another and a study and uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I know. I know. I know a couple of my friends that were in LMSA at, um, and they got like support to go to like conferences and things, which I think it's great. Yeah, we. Um, I feel like we have a really strong presence in the LMSA. Uh, Midwest Regional um, Board. A lot of us went to the LMSA conference. A lot of us are in the regional board, a lot of the MSU folks. So it's um, it's been nice to find community in the Midwest too. Yeah, um, do we have any other questions because are we going to have to let them go? Um, we're approaching. Uh, we're approaching the um, the deadline of two p.m., which is five p.m. your time. All right. Well, we're going to let everyone go. Um, thank you again for coming. Mm -hmm.